Hey guys, it's Phil here from the Next Civic Toyota's team. I'm at home tonight and I thought I'd run through a quick review of what I carry in my first aid kit. This is the Maxpedition FR1 pouch, uh, used as a medical kit in this case, but it is made to be used for anything you want really. Um, you will have seen it in a lot of the videos that we do. I definitely carry it every time I go out on, uh, in the outdoors. I certainly carry it on any SES uh, deployments or any training exercises, anything like that. And a lot of the time I carry it with me in my everyday carry pack. It is quite a heavy kit. Uh, it's heavy alone when it's empty, but it's certainly heavy when it's stocked up. So sometimes I'll carry something a little bit smaller, a few knickknacks in my bag. Sometimes I'll carry this with me like today. Depends on uh, what sort of mood I'm in. Um, I will say the one time I took this to Christchurch, not this last trip, but the trip before, uh, waiting to go hiking with a friend in, in uh, Rickerton, a lady, elderly lady uh, beside us tripped in the middle of the road on a uh, bollard that was protecting uh, stopped cars from running up on the footpath and uh, cracked her skull open quite badly. And uh, yeah, I was managed to have my first aid kit there, quite comprehensive at that time. Um, I wasn't long out of the ambulance service then uh, as a volunteer, so I had a few more things in my kit than I do now. Uh, but yeah, sometimes you just never know when you're going to need a first aid kit out and about in the city, uh, like in an earthquake, for example, or, or a flood or any sort of disaster situation, but also certainly when you're going out um, hiking. Matthew and I, we always carry our own kits as, lo as well as the SES kits that they provide. Uh, if I'm going out hiking in the um, forest with Not You, Not Me, or even by myself, I'll always carry a kit with me. In Australia especially is a pretty unpredictable place. A lot of wild creatures, there's a lot of uh, different animals out there and there's certainly some pretty changeable weather and uh, New Zealand certainly has some very changeable weather. So, um, you know, things can happen in a, in a very short period of time. Rocks can get slippery, you can take a fall, uh, you can get cut. Here you've got poisonous creatures everywhere, so, well, Exaggeration, but there are certainly some very uh, toxic and poisonous creatures here, and so it's good to have some stuff on board to deal with that. Uh, and then your average, your own personal medicine, etc. All right. So before I actually go over what's in my kit, I just wanted to say uh, a little note here. I think the carrying of a first aid kit uh, is vitally important, but I think uh, not only carrying the kit's important, but uh, what you carry in it is is vital as well. And uh, throughout my time in uh, well, as a volunteer with the ambulance service here in the search and rescue and the SES sort of side of things, you see a uh, variety of people with a, you know, a, a very uh, varied range of, of things carried in their kits. There are some people who have absolutely no training, uh, but have the most uh, highly stocked kits with all the goodies like uh, sutures, uh, um, scalpels, OP airways, that sort of stuff. But don't have the training to use them, wouldn't know how to use them, and uh, you know might actually present a bit of a danger to the public uh, were they to try and use them in, a, in an emergency situation. And you know they might have got their training from YouTube, for example. Now, while it's good for some things, it's probably like diagnosing a d disease on on Google. It's not always the not always the best way to get your learning, I, I guess. You would say, uh, don't get me wrong, there's heaps of things that you can learn on YouTube and there's, and there's some good medical advice out there, uh, but nothing uh, beats actual practical uh, training and uh, practice. I, and so you see people that are well and truly overstocked but wouldn't know how to use that necessarily. You see people that are totally understocked and go out with a couple of band-aids and, uh, and that's about it. So you've got to find that balance. Whatever works for you, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, knocking people if they want to carry all that gear. I certainly used to have that sort of stuff in my kits, and there probably was a time when I could give, uh, inject certain drugs, or uh, yeah, there was a time when I had a um, practicing certificate or um, of sorts, and uh, was trained to use that sort of stuff. Now I'm just uh, a general everyday first aider, and so I keep my kit pretty basic to what I know and what I expect to encounter. So uh, whenever I'm out, I always carry a snake bite kit. You can check out, I'll put a link to the video of the kit that we've produced. Uh, you might be interested in checking it out here in Australia. Uh, use the um, pressure bandage technique. It's pretty important and uh, it can definitely save your life if you're unfortunate enough to be bitten by a snake over here. Uh, and this kit here. So um, I'll turn it over to the kit and we'll have a look at what we've got inside it. Alright, so like I said, this first aid kit I store it in is the um, Expedition FR1. I might do a review of that pack later on. Uh, a lot of people rave about it, a lot of people don't. 
Um, I think it's a pretty neat, well-constructed kit, but uh, as part of it, it's it's so um, precise and so well detailed that um, you know it's hard to store a whole lot of stuff in there in some in some cases. So, anywho, this is the kit here. Um, on the front there, I've got a little first aid patch. Thanks to not you, not me. Just so people know, sometimes I store it on the outside of my bag. It'll give them easy uh, recognition that it's a first aid kit, and uh, you know, lets me know that it's my first aid kit. Not that I should really uh, need reminding. So uh, the kit itself actually folds out quite nicely, like this, into two halves. There is a uh, drawstring, for example. You could put it up here, and I don't know. I've really not got the point of that, but what I do know is there's quite a, a suitable amount of uh, paracord used in this so that's easy to cut off and use that for something like uh, tying on a splinter or a splint or tying up uh, maybe you could even use it as a a tourniquet if, if, uh, if it's a life-threatening sort of situation there um, I'll come around to the side and go through what we've got in here alright so uh, first off um, medication I've got an asthma inhaler I occasionally suffer from asthma I haven't had it for quite a long time but there's the odd occasion something like pollen or dust or something will set it off um, so I carry this also it's good to note this is uh, you don't need a prescription to get this here in Australia but you do back in New Zealand asthma is a very serious medical emergency it's one of those drugs that you can uh, share with people if need be so um, if someone is having an asthma attack a severe difficulty breathing uh, you're not going to do much harm by giving this to them to try unless they have a known allergy to that which they should be able to let you know about but um, it's one of those drugs you can freely share with people but uh, it is a lifesaver um, so I carry that with me here uh, in here I've got a little bag set up I've got some uh, insect repellents and uh, some hydration fluids here mixed with water some aspirin, aspirin here, I've got some uh, Voltara and all of these are sort of uh, labelled, they're just little bags that I put the pills in to cut down on packaging, it's labelled with what the drug is and uh, the, the uh, dosage of the drug for example, here we've got some cold and flu tablets, sin sinus relief, uh, <laughs> this blue one's actually uh, Finnegan or Finnegan as they call it over here, that's an allergy or antihistamine pill there that's very useful, very very drowsy, sometimes I take it just to get to sleep if I'm not sleeping well. I've got some water purification tablets just in case. I've got some endone oxycodone here, this is mild to severe pain. I must say I got this off uh, a relative who had some surgery done and I took it. <laughs> uh, I think if I get hurt in the in the bush I'm gonna go out uh, with the no pain anyway. Um, Barufin here, this is 800 milligrams, pretty sizable tablets here, and a couple of 400 milligram tablet tablets. Uh, oh, that one's empty. Uh, this one is just, um, I got these off a Korean friend of mine, but this is, it says here, it says uh, Gaviscon, so pretty much it's just uh, for those tummy, tummy upsets and things like that, uh, antacids or indigestion sort of thing, and both of these are the same sort of product, one's a powdered one, one's a liquid, one shot sort of thing, so they're pretty useful to have. Again the medicines in the first aid kit, it's definitely a personal uh, preference, yeah, you know, people are going to want to carry different brands, different medicines, they might have their own allergies and so on, so you know, it's good to get an idea, but again the, the first aid kit really has to be a personal, personal thing there. Alright, uh, next on the thing I've got a uh, pen torch here, on off. This is great for checking the reactions of your pupils. Uh, it can indicate things like head uh, head trauma or uh, brain damage sort of thing. Um, yeah, you often see that in the movies. You're basically looking to see how um, how the pupils dilate and whether they do so evenly. Um, if you've got it, great. You can take down that sort of information. Sort of, uh, is, are they dilating at the same time? Are they come? You know, do they come back to the same? Uh, size at the same time or does the left react, right react, all that sort of stuff might be useful for medical personnel as an observation. Uh, and here I've got a Sharpie pen, pretty much because they uh, are a waterproof pen, they work very well, they last forever. Great for marking, writing down stuff, information about a patient, for example. Uh, next I've got some mini shears. I do have a pair of bigger shears somewhere but this fits quite nicely in the pack like this. Um, 
here I've got quite a selection of saline. Okay, um, this is one of the things I really think you can never have enough of. Uh, like I said, that lady in Christchurch, well, last time I was in Christchurch, or the time before, a lady fell over and cracked the skull open um, quite badly, and uh, saline, we used saline, myself and another person who was an army medic, to uh, irrigate the wound and uh, get some dressings on there. So, you know, this stuff is fantastic. It's pretty cheap. You can find it on the internet in bulk, bulk buys. Um, so, you know, I certainly recommend stocking up on that if you were looking to put together a good kit. And the thing that goes with that, of course, are things like this. You've got uh, sterile dressings. You've got quite a, a number of them here. Yeah, these are all just sterile dressing and gauze swabs. So they can be soaked in saline, and you can use that to clean out a wound, for example. Uh, looking after that lady, just as an example, back in Christchurch, I would have had a kit probably twice the size of this, and uh, gone through at least this much, if not twice as much, uh, gauze, just trying to clean out the wound and then stop the bleeding and get it patched up. So. Uh, again, this is this stuff's pretty cheap if you buy it bulk. If you're just going to the chemist and getting it one off, two off, it is pretty expensive. But if you can find a good deal, maybe get together with some other outdoors people or preppers or whatever, and, and put your money together and get a bulk purchase on the internet. You'll probably find that you can get it for a good price. And uh, while they do have um, expiry dates, quite frankly, when it comes to first aid, as long as it's not open, I don't think it's going to matter. Diddly squat, uh, the amount of stuff that gets thrown out and in the industry just because it's out of date. For your own personal first aid kit, I'm not going to worry about it. I've definitely got some here. I mean, this expired in 2008. It's just a sterile piece of gauze. Uh, I don't know if it's still sterile, but when it comes to, if it's going to save my life, I'm not too worried about that being expired, personally. But again, that's totally up to you. Here we've got some Steri strips. Got a few packets of those. These are cool little uh, things used to, uh, they're pretty much strips to close the wound. If you've got a uh, wound that might need stitches in the field and you don't have any stitches, you can use these to close them up. I was once told that there's no no call for these or uh, place for these in the ambulance service, but certainly use these on a multitude of occasions. And, uh, you know, um, if you don't have stitches at the time, they're, they're definitely helpful to use uh, for those smaller, smaller cuts. And, um, you know, it's better than leaving that wound open and exposed to uh, anything that might infect get into it and cause an infection. Um, I have a signaling mirror in my first aid kit. Uh, I, I don't know, I mean first aid, something might happen, you might need to signal someone. I've always got a whistle as well. Um, it's just a useful device to carry. So I always carry two of those on me, one in my survival kit and one in the first aid kit. Got some Stingos spray, as in sting goes away if you've been stung by something. Um, active ingredient, aluminum sulfate. It's pretty good for calming and soothing itches or swelling of stings and bites from things like sand flies, mosquitoes and wasps, uh, and bees, etc, etc, vines and nettles. Of course, um, <coughs> if you've got an allergy to bees and things like that, or a severe allergy, you might go into anaphylactic shock. You'd be wanting to keep your own medicines with you, you know, uh, in your first aid kit. Something like an EpiPen depending on, you know, whatever you've, whatever you've got, but this is good, uh, I don't have any allergies that I know of, and this seems to do a reasonable job of taking away some of that sting. Next, I carry this fantastic stuff, this is called Fixamol. It's actually reasonably expensive, um, we've got quite a bit of it in here, or maybe some of my other first aid kit, but basically it's for using to uh, stick over wounds, so if you were going to put a, a piece of gauze over a cut, and then you wanted to stick this to the body, it peels off like so. You expose that part of it here, and that will sit on your skin, maybe like so, with something underneath it, to make your own sort of dressing or bandage. And it's very, very good stuff. Very sticky, but it doesn't hurt when it comes back off your skin. Uh, what was that? It was $3.95 a meter. <coughs> it is pretty expensive, but it's a fantastic product. It's got a bit discolored and dirty there, but anyhow it'll still do the job for me. Um, so it's Fixamol, and uh, you can get that at most pharmacies these days, or ambulatory suppliers. Uh, most important, of course, 
probably should have mentioned that first, but I carry gloves. There's probably about five pairs of um, latex gloves. I don't carry non non latex gloves. This is just what we use in our snake bite kits and, and all our other kits, and so I, I use these ones myself. Um, if you've got an allergy to latex, for example, or you know whatever you carry, then you carry whatever uh, suits you. But this is what I'm carrying here. A uh, thermal emergency blanket. I have this one left over from uh, since I was uh, a volunteer with the St John Ambulance Service back in Christchurch. Um, it's never going to expire. It's basically just a blanket that you can uh, put around a patient, for example, if you want to keep them warm, stop them getting, uh, stop them from getting any more exposure. If they're hypothermic, it's going to uh, seal in and reflect the heat back into their body, as opposed to allowing it to uh, <coughs> to escape and cool them down. They're actually very, very effective uh, blankets, but again, if the person is already cold, then they're not going to do a great job at um, heating them back up again. So it's best, you know, I mean, it's, it's better than nothing, but it's best to get them while they've still got some warmth left uh, in their body. Alright, so all of this stuff was stored on this side of the kit here. You've got a mesh pouch at the back, you've got these uh, elastic straps here, and they actually can be divided into two. There, so you can put stuff in between that. Uh, here on the front, you've got a, a, a large strip and then three smaller ones on top. So in that sense, it's a really well thought out pack. <coughs> uh, on the left or right hand side, left on, in my case, I've got uh, some tape here. It's just a fixing tape. Uh, it's made of these little micro pores and it's been pre-cut, so you can pretty much just tear this, <laughs> prove me wrong, tear it like that to any sort of shape or size that you desire, and it tears nice and straight. So great for affixing bandages or <coughs> anything else to the body there. Under here I've got some alcohol wipes. Kept in a little baggie to uh, protect these packages. They're not waterproof, so they get damaged, I found out, pretty easily. Under this one here, I've got some iodine swaps for wound clean cleansing. All single use sort of stuff, all very cheap again. I mean, we must have bought, I think, a thousand of these uh, for test testing out. It was cheaper to buy a thousand than it was to buy, say, 20, or you know, almost uh, by the time you're paying for postage. So we've got a whole lot of these here, great little things. <coughs> Sting like nothing if you get this in a wound, but they'll certainly clean up pretty good. Uh, on the left hand side here, <coughs> I've got two heavy crepe bandages. So these are the ones we use in our snake bite kits. I guess this is a backup to my snake bite kit. It can, uh, I've got the snake bite kit specifically for snake bites, but these can also be used for anything such as uh, putting on dressings, bandaging a wound. Uh, you could use it to, um, well, pretty much anything you can use a bandage for, that you can put your mind to. A uh, very, very useful thing to have. You can never have too many, I don't think, and especially these uh, heavy elastic bandages, I should have said, that um, have a very good uh, compression ability. So that's what you want to use for snake bite kits, or snake bites, should I say. Uh, it's going to restrict that flow of the lymphatic system and give you time to get help. So, that there. Triangular bandage. A very useful thing to have. Great for uh, broken arms, broken limbs and also for uh, keeping limbs immobilized, for example, if you don't have any string or rope or a paracord, for example, you can immobilize arms or legs with that just by tying them up. In fact, I've got two of those in there. And that pretty much sums up the um, contents of my kit at the moment. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of people out there saying, Jesus, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty small kit, there's not much in it, you need this and that, blah, 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 and... Uh, um, good for you. I mean, I appreciate any comments or criticisms or, or uh, positive comments if you've got them. Um, but uh, I, I do believe that uh, first aid kits are uh, a very personal thing and that you should prepare uh, only what you can use and what you're trained to use and, uh, you know, keep practicing with what you've got. Hey guys, thanks very much for uh, watching there. As you see, I've gone through that first aid kit and what I carry in it. Uh, like always, I've sort of jibber-jabbered on a bit too much, and it's uh, turned out to be a lot longer than I wanted it to be. But uh, I don't really see how I could have made it shorter except for talking like I'm doing now. Nonetheless, um, I want to just 
reiterate the point I was trying to make before at the beginning, and that is that the first aid kit is, in my opinion, uh, and it may differ to everyone else, but it's a very personal piece of kit that you carry. Um, it's important, I think, that if you are going to carry a first aid kit, that you're at least trained in some basic first aid. You see a lot of first aid kits, they're sold with manuals in them, how to deal with this, how to deal with that situation. Uh, frankly, yeah, that might be good if you've got a little cut on the finger, but if you've got a cardiac arrest, or you've got a broken bone, or you've got a, an open fracture, for example, it's too, it's, it's a bit late to be reading the book at that point. Uh, you know, it might be great as a refresher, but good, good to get it out of the kit once you've got it and go through it and practice that sort of stuff, get together with your friends, practice that sort of stuff before you actually need to use it. It's a bit late once it happens. And likewise, that goes for what you put in your first aid kit. There'll be people that have had a look at this kit that I've shown you tonight. They'll disagree with what I carry. They'll suggest this, this, and this, and this. Um, good. It's very personal. It's up to you what you carry. I know that I have, uh, when I worked with the ambulance service as a volunteer, I had, a, I had quite a large kit that I carried in my pack that included stuff like the blood pressure, the um, blood sugar level testing kits, all sorts of stuff, bag, valve, mask, a lot of different things. At that, that, at that time I was trained to a certain level, I could administer certain drugs even more under um, the supervision of higher higher educated or a superior, um, I don't know, uh, paramedics for example. And uh, that was good, but right now I don't have uh, any scope of practice here or qualifications that match that anymore. I'm trained to, I guess, workplace first aid sort of uh, level. And so I carry what I'm confident using. I've gone through the scenarios in my head, I've thought about this and that, this is what I might encounter out in the bush, <clears throat> this is what I feel comfortable uh, dealing with, and this is what I carry, and lots of it. Uh, it's just, it's, yeah, and, and that's why I also carry things like my beacon, my uh, rescue beacon, for example. It's good to be able to do first aid, but if you're trapped in the middle of nowhere <clears throat> and you've got a six hour walk out or a two day walk out, you're screwed whichever way you look at it. Uh, you know, you send someone off and they take two days to get out or a day to get out to raise the alarm and you're poked. So, um, you know, that beacon, for example, combined with the first aid kit and the first aid skills might be enough to get you out alive. You don't know. I mean, it's, you ne we can't predict what's going to happen. So that's why we prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Um, the other thing I, I would say is that uh, I've mentioned this a few times, you look on, on YouTube for example, there are a lot of people that have some fantastic looking kits uh, and uh, the best of the best tools and might not necessarily be trained to use those. Um, and that's really important, training and practice, 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 it makes perfect in the first aid's one of those things where that totally makes sense, that if you can get together with your friends, your preppers, your, your colleagues, outdoor group people, whatever sort of circles you move in, if you're into this sort of stuff, get together and practice it. That's the, that's the best advice I can give you, you know, like it, it, from my opinion, from my experience. Uh, first aid uh, can be a scary thing. Uh, rendering first aid to a heart attack victim or someone that's chopped a limb off or something. But uh, it's one of those skills that once you know how to do it and, and you get practice in it, then uh, you become more confident. And the more confident you are, the greater chance you have of helping someone in need or helping yourself rather than freezing or freaking out or doing something wrong. You know, I mean, just practice makes perfect. The other thing is, um, sort of on that point there, it's great to have the best gear in the world, but if you don't know how to use it, I think you're wasting your time. Uh, yeah, there might be someone in the group that you come across miraculously that can use that gear, fantastic. Uh, but they might not. And if, if you go and practice outside that scope of practice that you have that I was talking about before, for example, uh, you're trained in uh, pre-hospital first aid or workplace first aid or just basic first aid. You know, CPR, cuts, scrapes, that sort of stuff. And you find someone and they're choking, and they've, they've choked, they're down there, they're not breathing properly and you get your scalpel out and you start cutting away at their airway and trying to put a tube down there and they bleed to death and you've practiced outside of your scope, then you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in, you've got to deal with that. You've got to face face the firing squad, so to speak. You keep yourself within your scope of practice. It doesn't matter if you've seen it on Grey's Academy 10 times, Grey's Anatomy, sorry, 10 times. Uh, in, you know, just because you've seen it on TV doesn't mean it's going to work in reality. So it's really important to stay within that scope of practice. 
and, uh, and administer whatever first aid you can give, first aid, until someone with more advanced skills and advanced care arrives to take over from you. Anyway, that's enough of my ranting. Thanks very much for watching. Again, comments, criticisms, uh, queries, questions, leave them below and we look forward to uh, receiving those and answering them for you. Um, thanks very much. Cheers.